great, great. Hey, we're going to have a great afternoon together. I'm glad that you guys made it back out for Brother Josh uh, to hear his ministry here presented. A couple things i got to say about Brother Josh real quick. When you look at him, that is a real man. That is a real man. He's got a real man's beard, okay? Not all of us can do that. But anyway, I digress. Whatever. <laughs> no, that's pretty awesome. And then um, somebody else, somebody else said, we were talking about, obviously heading into Dearborn. They said, man, with that beard, you're going to fit in just perfect down there. That'll be great. That'll be great. <clears throat> that's awesome. And then one other thing, too, I have to say this. Um, Miss Dawn Morsey caught me. And we have uh, Sister Judith Ann back here. Josh, you are, is this correct? You are the great, great, great nephew. Yeah, right? There's five, five generations between. Uh, you're, you're, that's right. You're the great, great. And then, yeah, that's pretty impressive. That's pretty good. So we are, we're thrilled to have you guys here. And that's pretty awesome. So we're looking forward to this afternoon. I don't know if you guys can follow all of those great, great, greats, whatever. But anyway, it's pretty cool, though. And seriously, though, we are just thankful to have you guys here. We're going to get started with a word of prayer today. And then uh, we'll dive right in here to our afternoon service. Father, thank you so much for this day. Lord, I know that those words are so often used, but Lord, we do truly mean thank you. God, you have been good to us. Thank you for the safety that you've given to so many to make it out this morning, the safety on the roads. Father, I do pray that you continue that throughout the day. Father, I pray that you'd also give us just a great time today, uh, this afternoon now in your word. Father, through the presentation, be with Brother Josh, give him the exact words to say for this afternoon. Lord, prepare our hearts, draw us close to yourself. God, we are truly excited about what you're doing in our church. And Father, I pray now that you'd burden our hearts uh, for the city of Dearborn. Father, we would not only... Um, uh, Lord, just be praying for them, but seek to, to see how we can be a blessing for the Levesque family. And Lord, I pray that you'd use us in that way. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, stand with us if you would. We have enjoyed singing with you today and worshiping God together. Let's sing two more short ones. Uh, we'll start with I Love to Tell the Story, all right? I love to tell the story of a as we sing My Jesus, I Love Thee. My Jesus, I love Thee. I
seated as our group exits. Uh, we're gonna uh, switch gears here and we're gonna see a short video from Brother Josh. My name is Josh Levesque and this is my wife Katie and the Lord has led us to plant a church in Dearborn, Michigan. We are both lifelong Michiganders. I was born in Flint, Michigan and my father soon planted the Emmanuel Baptist Church in Corona, Michigan where I grew up and had the opportunity to watch that church grow from a few families in our living room to the thriving ministry that it is today. Growing up in a Christian home, I was quite early exposed to the gospel and I was saved at age seven when for the first time I realized that I was personally responsible for my sins and that that was why Jesus died and rose again so that I could have everlasting life simply through faith in him. And I surrendered to the ministry soon after at the age of 12 and have always desired to serve the Lord with my life and to use my life to spread the gospel. We met in high school and after graduating from Pensacola Christian College, we were married and had the opportunity to come on staff at our home church and have had the privilege to serve there for five years alongside Pastor Jason Georges and many other wonderful servants. It was there that I was ordained into gospel ministry and have had the opportunity to preach, to teach Sunday school, to follow up with guests, and to lead evangelistic outreach in the community. As we have grown spiritually, so has our family. The Lord has blessed us with three children, Riley, Brady, and Wesley. Over these years, the Lord has really began to show us the great need for new churches in America and the great need for churches in the Great Lakes region. And we believe that it is the responsibility of local churches to start local churches. And this burden led my pastor, Jason Georges, to initiate the Great Lakes 30 by 30 project. And this is a project intended to inspire 30 church plants in the Great Lakes region by the year 2030. We are thankful for the opportunity to present to all of you the calling and burden God has placed on us to plant a church in Dearborn, Michigan. The Lord began leading me in this direction for over 10 years as I became increasingly aware of the presence of Islam here in the state of Michigan and all across the United States. And at the same time, I developed an intense interest and enthusiasm for church planting, and that resulted in us surveying a handful of cities over the past five years. At one moment in the Michigan Revival Conference, during a prayer meeting that the Lord would revive the state of Michigan, the Lord really combined both of those passions into an intense passion and a burden to see a local church planted in the city of Dearborn, Michigan. When we began to investigate the need in the city of Dearborn, what we discovered both blew our minds but also broke our hearts. Dearborn is a city of 100,000 people with over 40,000 Arab Americans. But with the Arab culture has come the religion of Islam. In Dearborn alone, there are over 14 mosques and multiple Islamic schools. And as of today, there is not a Baptist church in Dearborn. We believe that every person should have the opportunity to attend a good Bible-believing church or live in a community with an active gospel witness. There was a region in Israel called Samaria, and Samaria was neglected, even avoided by the Jews because of differences in culture and religion that had resulted from foreign people moving in. But Jesus purposed to go through Samaria and to meet a woman there, and he told her, the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. There's a lot of worship that goes on in Dearborn, but unfortunately it's false worship because they worship another spirit and they do not have the truth. There's a very unique street in Dearborn. It's called Altar Road. And an altar is a place where worship is offered. And on this street, there is a lot of worship that is offered. It's a unique collection of religious buildings that I think represent the religious and cultural diversity of Dearborn. But central on Altar Road and central in the city of Dearborn is the Islamic Center of America. And it represents the headquarters of Islam here in Michigan and in North America. Jesus went on to say to that woman in Samaria that the time is coming and now is that the Father is seeking such to worship Him. You see, we serve a God who is seeking people to worship Him. We serve a God that is not willing that any should perish. He came to earth to seek and to save the lost. We serve a God that sent Jonah to Nineveh and Paul all across the world because he loves the whole world and sent his own son to die for the world because he loved him so much and wants the whole world to worship Him. 
everyone naturally worships. But too often this worship is misplaced on the objects of self, wealth, power, or in the name of a false god or a counterfeit version of Christ. These worthless pursuits leave the worshiper empty, alone, and hopeless. Only the worship of Jesus Christ can truly satisfy the worshiping heart. He alone is worthy of our worship, yet his worth is more than your worship or my worship alone can satisfy. He's worthy of more worship and he's worthy of more worshipers. Jesus' final earthly instructions were a commission to his disciples and to the church to be about the business of seeking worshipers and multiplying his worship. There is a unique opportunity in Dearborn to reach into the Islamic world with the gospel. Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world. Today there are nearly 2 billion Muslims that make up 25% of the earth's population and many of these live in places that we could never go. Closed countries that we cannot plant a church and cannot preach the gospel. But God loves these people so much that he brought them to Dearborn and he brought them to Detroit and he's brought them into the United States of America where we do have the freedom to plant a church and we do have the freedom to preach the gospel. And we've been given an incredible door right here in our own backyard in the state of Michigan to plant a church in Dearborn and to reach the Muslim world right here. Shortly after Jesus spoke to that woman in Samaria, he told his disciples to lift up their eyes and to look on the fields for they are white already to harvest. In Dearborn, we see a field that has been neglected, that has been avoided. And my fear is that we have allowed fruit to die in the field for a lack of harvesters. We have a unique opportunity in Dearborn, but we need your help. First, we are asking everyone to pray. Pray for our family and to ask the Lord to send us forth as laborers into his harvest. And secondly, we are asking you, pastors and churches, to make a financial investment into this church plan. Your monthly support or your special offering will directly help get the gospel to the people of Dearborn and have an impact here on the earth, but a greater impact in eternity. All right, thank you again so much for having us here. My name is Josh Levesque. And I was very much anticipating being here with you at Cornerstone. As, as I mentioned, we've been traveling and sharing with people our burden for the city of Dearborn and the church planting journey that the Lord is leading me and my family on. Uh, but this was a special one. I almost didn't even ask Pastor Nate. I just called him and said, when are we coming? And uh, he, so I've been looking forward to it and uh, was, was really excited to get here for a number of reasons. First is just the uh, many, many connections and, and family and friends that we have here. It always feels like a bit of a homecoming. Uh, coming back to Cornerstone. I know not everybody here knows me, so I'll, tell, I'll fill you in a little bit uh, some of the story. Uh, as Pastor Nate mentioned this morning, I was kind of, I, I, I was born when my parents were here uh, at Cornerstone. My father was the youth pastor and interim pastor for a while here at Cornerstone before he went off and planted a Manu Baptist church in Corona, Michigan. And so we kind of come out of this church, but it goes even farther back than that. And uh, my grandparents and even my wife's uh, grandparents were part of the initial church plants in the Flint area that eventually merged to become Cornerstone. And so I say all that to say a couple of things. I'm definitely a, a lifelong Michigander. Our family goes back here a while and uh, love the state of Michigan. That's, I always knew when I wanted to do ministry that I wanted to be in Michigan. And when I, when I felt like the Lord was calling me to plant a church, I said, where in Michigan is the greatest need for a church? And uh, the Lord led us there to Dearborn. Also, that uh, I am definitely a lifelong and it's in my DNA to be a Baptist. It goes deep. And uh, generations and generations, but not just Baptists, but church planners. And uh, my family and, and back multiple generations have all been involved in church planting. And so I am excited to kind of even carry that torch on. And it's not just in, in me and my family, but in our church's DNA. And uh, we are all the result of somebody coming with a burden to an area and having a vision for a new church to be established. And that is the model, that is the New Testament model, the Great Commission, that churches would reproduce churches, and that that would not be able to be stopped uh, no matter who the president is, no matter what the country government is, uh, no matter what kind of oppression the church faces, they cannot stop the church because it is a reproducing organization. And so excited to carry that on, and I mentioned in the video the 30 by 30 project. Uh, we're praying that this will not just be one church plant, but will be one of 30 church plants that we see over the next 10 years in the Great Lakes region. There is a great need for churches. We have, uh, our church planting efforts have not kept up with the growth of population or with the closing of, uh, uh, closing of many churches. And the COVID and the pandemic has only accelerated this problem. 
And I, I have already seen it happening, and I'm afraid even more so. A lot of the churches that close their doors for the pandemic will never open them back up. And so it is time to go on the offensive in certain ways and identify targets and start praying, asking the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers into his harvest. And uh, we're excited to just have a small part of that. Uh, I uh, had the privilege to attend Pensacola Christian College and after that was able to come on staff at my home church at Emmanuel Baptist and have served there for five years now and uh, loved the church there, loved the ministry, had so many wonderful opportunities to grow and teach and and uh, operate in pastoral ministry and pastoral office, but just over a year ago, the Lord began to lay a, a new burden on my heart, and this wasn't uh, any kind of dissatisfaction or anything, it was just a bit of a longing for something, and didn't even know quite what it was, and we got involved in a conference called the Michigan Revival Conference, and we began gathering pastors together and gathering churches together, praying for our state, that the Lord would send revival, and as we did that, we were praying about revival, preaching about revival, we started to ask the question, what would revival really look like if it came? We're always praying for it, always asking for it, and we, we kind of get that you know, emotional, spiritual experience sometimes that we call revival, but what does real revival accomplish? And when we look back in history and we see some of the great revivals, the great awakenings and, and those types of movements, what was the result of that? And every time, ultimately, the, the fruit of true revival amongst God's people is a revival of church planting and a, re a renewed commitment to the Great Commission to go into all the world and to preach the gospel in our Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. And that starts local. That starts with reaching our neighbors. But then it, the next step is to start looking around at the cities around us and saying, where, where is there not a church? Where is a church needed? And then going and, and giving ourselves and giving our resources, giving our people and our, our re everything, our efforts, to see a church established in that area. And as we were doing that, I was open to the idea, knew that I wanted to be involved in church planting. And in a prayer meeting, someone started praying for the city of Dearborn. And it caught my attention. And another person prayed that the Lord would send someone to Dearborn. Another person prayed, Lord, send someone to plant a church in Dearborn. And I was in the back of the auditorium. I was supposed to be running the microphone around to people. And I wasn't doing my job very well because the Lord was really dealing with me there in the back of the auditorium. And, and I began to investigate. And what we found there... You saw some of the results in the video of our survey. It really was amazing. And it really broke my heart and it got my attention. And to the extent that, that I thought someone ought to do something. Someone ought to go to Dearborn. Someone ought to plant a church in this city. And when you do that, you have to be careful because the Lord usually is calling you to do that. And so uh, I, as I began to investigate, I started counting mosques. Started counting Lutheran churches, Presbyterian churches, other other denominations and things, and not one Baptist church in the city of Dearborn. Those of you that are familiar with Dearborn, it's a large city. It's 100,000 people. It's the biggest suburb of Detroit. It is the home of the Ford Motor Company, home of the Henry Ford Museum. It's, it's the birthplace of the automobile. If there's one city in our, in our state that has defined our entire lives, it's the city of Dearborn. I mean, who here hasn't been affected in some way by the auto industry? I mean, especially here in Flint, everybody feels that. It's, it's kind of our identity, our way of life, and that all was born right there in that, that city. I think it's a special place in our state. I think it's a special place culturally, but it's increasingly becoming a special place spiritually because the fastest growing religion in the world is the religion of Islam. And it has taken special interest and become a, a special uh, headquarters in the city of Dearborn. The city of Dearborn, with 100,000 people, as of the 2010 census, was over 45% Arab American. That's over 45,000 Arab people there in the city of Dearborn. The new census, I'm eagerly awaiting the results because I, I, the general consensus, what I believe we're going to see is that the skills have tipped in the city of Dearborn. It's over 50%, perhaps 60% or more Arab. The transformation has been dramatic. And you go there and you can see it. You hear the Arabic language. You see that curly Arabic script on signs. And everywhere that you go, you can't get away from it. But the problem there is not the Arab culture. The problem there is the Arab religion that has come with it. And that Islam has taken a, just a strong grip on that city. And it really grabbed a hold of my heart to say that someone needs to go there. Someone needs to be a light in that dark place. And I believe that the Lord is, is calling us there, and he's continued to affirm that, and we've be, begun to see wonderful results and, and wonderful enthusiasm amongst the churches of Michigan to go and to uh, help us in the city of Dearborn, to see Dearborn Baptist Church established. 
We are right now, tra- we just announced back in September, we've only been traveling for a couple of months and already have a dozen churches that have committed to support us there and have dozens more uh, this summer lined up. And so we're excited to be able to partner with churches to do this. But we'll be moving to Dearborn this spring and we will be working this summer evangelistically, going door to door, house to house, delivering John and Romans gospel material. And this September 12th, 2021 is our launch date. So be in prayer for that. Pray for that launch. We are, when we say launch, we're going to start having public services there in the city of Dearborn. And so we are rapidly working. We're going to try to hit the ground running, and we're raising our support while we are starting this church. And uh, we're going to be raising support and traveling all the way up till that first Sunday. And so we have a busy year ahead of us. We have a lot of work, but I am thrilled to be a part of it. And what I want to share with you from the Bible here tonight is some of the, some of the why. Why are we doing this? Why are we going to Dearborn when so many people have left? When so many of the other churches have closed or moved? Why is it time to go in there? Why should we care what happens in Dearborn? And to show you that, I want to go to the book of Jonah. We're going to look at Jonah chapter 4. And Jonah, as you know, is the classic example of the runaway prophet. The one who was called of God to go and went the other way. And I have to admit, dealing with this calling and burden for the city of Dearborn, I had to wrestle with perhaps some of the same things that Jonah wrestled with and and being called to a place that not many people would want to go and not many people are going. The fact that there are no churches there, it was not always the case. Just in the past decade, multiple churches, Baptist churches, have left, have closed, have moved, have sold their buildings, And in many of those cases, their buildings are now mosques. And it is a sight to see a little Baptist church building. You know, you can even still see the lettering where they took Baptist church off the side of the building. You know, they they leave it there. You can tell what it was as almost a trophy (laughs) in ways of the transformation that is going on there. But when Jonah was called to go to Nineveh, we see his immediate reaction was in the opposite direction. And as there's really no hesitation, we read in Jonah chapter 1, the Lord calls him to go, and, you know, before the Lord even hardly finishes the sentence, the calling, Jonah's going the other direction, getting on a boat, buying a ticket, he's gone, he's out of there. Didn't want anything to do with it. And if we kind of get this question right off in our minds in the beginning, and, and, and the question is, why? Why did he do this? Why did he react in such an uncharacteristic way? I mean, Jonah was a prophet of God. He was a godly man. He knew his Bible. He knew the Word. We read in the book of 1 Kings that Jonah was one that brought messages to the king. He was faithfully executing the office of the prophet until he gets this calling for the city of Nineveh, and he's out the door. What caused this flight? Now, I've heard a lot of ideas offered up about this, and some people say perhaps it was fear. That's kind of one of the common ones. Jonah was afraid to go to Nineveh. And I'm sure that was part of it. Nineveh was an intimidating place. Nineveh was the center of power of the whole world. It was the capital of the Assyrian Empire, And they were incredibly powerful, and they were incredibly violent. It was a violent place. It would have definitely been an intimidating place to go, but looking at Jonah's character and his personality, I don't think Jonah was a really fearful guy. He talked to the king. Uh, Later on, he volunteers to be thrown off a boat into a stormy ocean. It's pretty brave. And then once he does finally obey God, he goes, marches into the middle of Nineveh, and boldly says, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown predicts their demise. A very unpopular message, but he he acts with great boldness. And so I think fear was a factor, but I don't think it was the primary factor. There's something else. And we're almost left wondering, what? why did he behave this way? All the way until we get to chapter 4. And chapter 4 kind of brings it all together, and it tells us the answer to this question. Why did Jonah run? Why did he not want to go to Nineveh? We read in Jonah chapter 4, verse 1. This is talking about the repentance of Nineveh. Jonah went and prophesied to Nineveh, and it was an incredible revival. The whole city turns around. They get on their knees before God, and they they change their ways, and they beg God for mercy. And we read in Jonah chapter 4, verse 1, it says, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. He was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repentest thee of the evil. 
Let's bow our heads for prayer, and then we'll look at, at this answer here. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you again for the opportunity to present your word to your people here. Lord, I pray that you would do a work in each and every heart here, Lord, and, and open our hearts, Lord, not just to uh, the Muslim people and the Arab people, but all the lost people around us every single day. Lord, teach us from this example of Jonah here in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. So what is the answer here? We see the people repent, there's revival, and it displeased Jonah exceedingly. Jonah is upset that these people repented. And then he turns around and he tells God, he said, God, isn't this what I told you when I was back in my country? Isn't this what I said before I ran, before I went to Tarshish? You see, Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh because he did not want the people of Nineveh to repent. He did not want God to extend mercy to Nineveh. He said, God, this is what I said. If I go to Nineveh, you're good and you're gracious and you're loving. And if I go there and preach to these people, they're going to repent and you're going to change your mind and you're going to give them mercy. Jonah knew that was, going to, what that was going to happen and that's why he didn't want to go. Jonah had a deep prejudice in his heart against the people of Nineveh. He had, he had a deep prejudice. He had a, 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 an opinion against this entire group of people that was so vehement, that was so intense we would say he had a hatred for the people of Nineveh. He hated them, truly. Now, that word hate is thrown around today like crazy. Everything is called hate. And most of what's called hate today is not hate. But this is hate. Because I believe there is no greater hatred than a willingness to allow someone to experience the wrath of God. A willingness to see somebody be destroyed and face God's eternal wrath. For their sins. That's where Jonah was at. Jonah would have rather seen Nineveh be destroyed than repent. See how messed up this is inside of Jonah. He was willing to see them, and not, not just willing, but he would have preferred it. That's kind of when he went up there, he's kind of waiting for the fireworks. He wanted to see some Sodom and Gomorrah fire and brimstone come down on these people because of their wickedness. And that's because Nineveh was his enemy. In every sense of the word, Nineveh was the enemy. An enemy is simply someone who is opposed to you, against you, in so many ways. And so in every way that we can think of it, Nineveh was the enemy. They were against Jonah politically. They were an active threat to his nation. If Nineveh had their way, they would destroy Israel, and guess what? They eventually did. But that was kind of imminent, that Nineveh was a threat to Jonah, to his family, to his country, to his way of life. Everything Jonah knew, they were against. They were his enemy politically. They were his enemy spiritually. They were polytheists. They worshipped many gods. They were pagans. They, they would have uh, practiced all kinds of wickedness, including human sacrifice and, and, and sacrifice of their children. And, and so in every way, these people were the enemy. They were against everything Jonah stood for. And so Jonah let it get to the point where he hated this enemy so much that he was willing to see them suffer the wrath of God. See, he was thinking nationalistically, because he says, was not this my saying when I was back in my country? He has a bit of a us versus them. They're the enemy, God. What, what, what are we doing sparing the enemy? Because they were against him, he took up a posture against them. And because they were his enemy, he hated them. Pastor Nate talked about some of the shocking statements of Jesus this morning, and he has a lot of them. Most of what Jesus said was like countercultural, unexpected, was hard for people to wrap their minds around because it was so different from what they were used to and what they had heard. Jesus did that in Matthew chapter 6, uh, verse 43. He said, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. You see, Jesus is saying, You've heard this saying, right, everybody? Love your neighbor, hate your enemy. That was the sentiment of the day. That was common, because that is the way of the world. That is natural. That is the way of man. Love your neighbor. Love the person who thinks like you, acts like you, is close to you, likes you, loves you, cares for you, but hate the person who is not like you, who is, believes different from you, acts different from you, looks different than you. That is the natural way of the world. Love your neighbor, hate your enemy. And Jesus says, everybody, you know this, right? That was the common way of life in Jesus' day. It was the common way of life in Jonah's day. Love your neighbor, love the Israelite, love the Jew, hate your enemy, hate the Ninevite, hate the uh, Philistine, hate those that are against you. And that is the way of the world today. 
Love your neighbor, hate your enemy. We see it all over. Uh, hate is rampant in our society. If somebody disagrees with you politically or, or in anything, they're the enemy, you hate them, you, you call them out, you, you attack them. That is the way that the world has always been. But how counterculture, how surprising then are the words of Jesus when he says, you've heard, love your neighbor, hate your enemy, but I say unto you, love your enemy. Love your enemy. Jesus turns it on its head. And realize when Jesus says, love your enemy, he's not denying the existence of enemies. There was always going to be enemies, especially as Christians. There are always going to be enemies because the world is against God. And so there are always going to be people against us. And there is always going to be an enemy. Jesus doesn't say, don't have enemies. He says, love your enemy. Don't hate your enemy. One of the ways that this has played itself out in our society, and one of the ways that the Lord burdened me with this passage when I read it, is that as a culture and as a country, we have identified the Arab people and the Muslim people as our enemies. And again, it's naturally so. Mus Muslim people around the world have been an active violent threat against our soldiers, against our culture, against our way of life. We've all heard and seen the chants, death to America, still going on today in nations like Iran. And so in every sense of the idea, every sense of the word, yes, they are our enemy. And it's been my lifetime, the past 20 years now, since the Twin Towers fell, that our natural enemy has been the Arab. And it, it has a way of kind of building into our psyche and into our mind that when we see an Arab person or see a person in, in a burqa or wearing a uh, hijab, that there's a little bit of a repulse. Or when we see a mosque, that it maybe stirs up some enmity or some anger. I've had so many people come and admit this to me after presenting our ministry that when they see Arab people, they, they can't talk to them. They don't want to talk to them. Or when they see a mosque, they want to blow it up. <laughs> and I'm sure everybody's had similar thoughts. And it's natural because, yes, in so many ways, religiously, spiritually, nationalistically, they're the enemy. They're against us. They believe different than us. A Muslim will never affirm the fact that Jesus Christ is God. They can't. It's, it's, it, our, our religions are not compatible. We do not worship the same God. We're there, this is not a, a, a polytheistic idea that we all have different paths to heaven. We, we meet and we clash because ultimately we have two opposite ideas about who God is and how to get to heaven. And so, yes, in so many ways, they are the enemy. In this past 20 years, as national enmity has grown against Arab people, Arab people have at the same time been flooding into our cities, especially the city of Dearborn and the city of Detroit. It has become immigration central for people coming from the Middle East. Dearborn is filled with Iraqis, Yemenis, Syrians, Jordanians, Palestinians, Egyptians, and increasingly now Yemenis is kind of the overwhelming majority. Uh, from all over the Middle East, they come here. It's, it's, a, it's a bit of an Ellis Island for Arab people. They come and and learn English, and get their citizenship, and, and work, and get jobs, and spread out all over the world, but it's been happening rapidly. But as kind of enmity towards Arab people have grown, the Arab population in Dearborn has grown. At times, those two things have come together in a bit of a volatile mix to where Dearborn itself has become the object of hatred of American people, and sadly, of Christian people in Dearborn. Dearborn has seen a lot of hate come from all around the country. It's seen a lot of hate come from Christian people and Christian organizations. So much so, there was an article published by Bloomberg in 2012 that is entitled, Dearborn, Where Americans Come to Hate Muslims. And it has gotten so bad at times, you have all perhaps remember the headlines of people going to Dearborn to publicly burn Korans, vandalize mosques, march through the streets with pigs' heads on spikes. I talked to a Christian man in Dearborn yesterday. I had lunch with him, and he, he was bemoaning the fact that these things went on in Dearborn. He said, 
those kind of efforts have set us back here as Christians. And it's given Christianity a black eye in this city in so many ways because people expressed their enmity in hatred. And that is not the way. That is not the way of Jesus Christ. He says, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. You see, we are entreated by Jesus not to return hate for hate. We can still recognize an enemy, a political, ideological enemy, and not express that difference in hate. See, that's the Christian way. That's what the world is so foreign to the world that you can disagree with somebody and not hate them. That you can express an idea that is different and that is not an act of violence or hatred. We are entreated by Jesus to love the Muslim people, bless the Muslim people, do good to the Muslim people, pray for the Muslim people. And the most loving thing that you can do, if, if we say the greatest act of hatred and the greatest act of prejudice is to be willing for somebody to experience the wrath of God, then on the other hand, the most loving thing you can do for a person or a group of people or a city or a nation, the most loving thing you can do is give to them the gospel and explain to them how they can escape the wrath of God. Explain to them the, the way of life. And you can be the bearer of the good news of Jesus Christ. And this is again where the world has it so backwards. Because the gospel today so often, and the Bible today so often, is labeled as hate speech. And to simply be a Christian, and to believe what the Bible says about creation, and about marriage, and about the family, and about morality is labeled as hate. And it's only going to become more so. We will be labeled as haters and accused of hatred and perhaps even prosecuted for hate crimes for believing the Bible and preaching the gospel. But that is so backwards because the gospel is the ultimate expression of love. The gospel is that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It is an act of love. It's a message of love. And the need in Dearborn is not a political one. It's not even really a cultural one. It's a spiritual one. The need in Dearborn is the gospel. The need in Dearborn is the Bible. It's the word of God. It's Jesus Christ. It, it blows my mind sometimes to see these people, they, they come to America and they come to places like Dearborn fleeing war-torn countries, fleeing economic depression, fleeing injustice. And then they come over here and then try to establish Islam and Sharia law and all of these things, and I don't know if they don't put the two together, that that's what causes all of that disruption. That's what causes so much of the war. That's what's causing so much of the hatred that you ran from. The things that we love about America and the freedoms that we enjoy are, are a result of this book, are a result of the, the principles of, of Christian liberty. The only truly free people in the world, the only true free nations in the world, are those that have recognized the principles in the Word of God and understanding of the Gospel. And that was deeply embedded in the foundation of our nation. And so we can bemoan the transformation that's going on in Dearborn and say, oh, it's so terrible, it doesn't look like America anymore, it doesn't feel like America to be there. Or we can understand the root of the problem. And we can go there on a mission of mercy and compassion to share the Gospel with these people. And so that was the heart of Jonah. Jonah looked at these people he saw an enemy. And unfortunately, he let that enmity and that hatred get to such a level that he did not even want to be part of their salvation. Didn't even want to see it happen. Now, God has a way of changing people's minds and hearts. For Jonah, it was a storm and a whale, and it was quite traumatic and violent and, and rapid, and all of a sudden, God got him there, and he preached, and they repented. And then we come to chapter 4, and Jonah seems to be right back where he began, and, and he reveals his enmity towards these people, but what was the heart of God towards Nineveh? And how should we feel about those people that we would label as our enemies, spiritually or even our political enemies? There are a lot of people in America that we would say, disagree, we would disagree with on every level. And are, are, we're going to undeniably come into contact and conflict with those people because we are different, because they are enemies. How should we 
feel about those people. And God taught Jonah a lesson here about how to view people, how to view lost people, and how to view your enemies with a plant that he prepared. Look at verse 6. Jonah chapter 4, verse 6 says, And the Lord prepared a gourd and made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceeding glad of the gourd. So while Jonah is having his pity party, sitting on the top of the cliff, you know, angry that these people repented, God has a gourd grow up to shelter him from the sun. And Jonah is thrilled. He, like, loves this gourd. And God is using this as a bit of an object lesson to kind of show the absurdity of Jonah's thinking here. Jonah is completely backwards in his mind about how he should be viewing these people because he starts to have some affection and affinity towards this plant. And why is that? Because that plant was doing something beneficial for Jonah. And it was a comfort to him. And so he started to really love that object. And in American Christianity, I think so often we fall into that same trap of of loving objects and comforts and luxuries and, and all of the things that God gives to us more than people. To the extent that our comforts can actually keep us from serving God. When Jonah sat on that cliff, he saw enemies, looked on them with prejudice. But that was not the way that God looked on those people. Listen to what God says to Jonah here in verse 8 through 11. It says, And it came to pass, when the sun did arise, that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat upon the head of Jonah, that he fainted and wished in himself to die, and said, It is better for me to die than to live. And God said to Jonah, Doest thou well to be angry for the gourd? And he said, I do well to be angry, even unto death. God gives Jonah a chance here. God's just trying to get Jonah to admit how foolish he's acting here and how how ridiculous he's being. Jonah, is this a good idea to be mad about a plant dying? Jonah's sticking with his story. He's like, Jonah is not getting the picture yet. He says, no, it's good. I am totally justified to be upset about this plant, so much so that I want to die. And he's very dramatic about it. Verse 10, Then said the Lord, Thou hast had pity on the gourd. Which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in a night, perished in a night. Should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand and also much cattle? And the book ends right there. I mean, God literally just, I mean, sticks it right into Jonah here. And, and Jonah, we believe, is the author of this book. And I, it's interesting to me that Jonah doesn't write any more after this. So I think that was the closing statement. God here just wrapped it all up in a nice bow, and just, I believe Jonah was just crushed here to realize how wrong he had been. Because God says, Jonah, you have had pity on a gourd, on a plant, because of what it did for you and and, and all the comfort and joy that it brought to you. But you could not extend that same pity to a city of over half a million people. You cared more about the plant than this multitude of people. Shouldn't I have pity on those people? And this is the eyes and the heart of God, is that of pity. And so the question is, when we look at the lost world, and we look at those people, even those people that are our enemies, that hate us, that if they had their way, they would totally destroy everything about our way of life, and our religion, and our God, and our churches. How do we act towards those people? Do we have prejudice? Or do we have pity on them? God had pity. Pity is the ability to enter in and feel the suffering of another person. To put your feet in their shoes. To understand their true dilemma. It's the same word essentially as compassion. And Jesus is the ultimate example of compassion because when Jesus was in Israel, and he looked, and the Bible says he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion. He had so much love for those people, and his heart broke for them. Why? Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. They were lost. They had no hope on their own. And Jesus came to this earth to seek and to save the lost. That was his mission. 
And that is the mission that he commissioned his, his disciples with, to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature because they don't have any hope. On their own, they have no hope. Jesus is the only way. The gospel is the only way to be saved. And when Jonah looked at Nineveh, all he saw was an enemy. And all he could feel for them was hatred, enmity, prejudice. But God had a different perspective, and he used this plant to teach Jonah a couple of things. He says in verse 10, Thou hast had pity on the gourd, for which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow. Jonah, you had nothing to do with the growth of that plant. And yet every single person in that city is created by God in his image, designed by God. And God, like a, like a gardener, has, has nurtured and, and allowed them to grow, provided them with food and water and sun and wind and rain and clothes on their back, even though they're his enemies, even though the people in Nineveh hated God. And even though there are people all around the world that hate God, you know what? God doesn't hate them. He gives good things to all of his creatures. And he gives them life. God sees created beings. But God also sees eternal beings. He says, Jonah, you had pity on the gourd for which you didn't labor or grow, and that gourd was here one day and gone the next. That gourd was a, a temporary thing that has no impact after it's gone. But every single person in Nineveh and every single person in this world is an eternal being created by God to live somewhere forever. And this is what Jonah was missing. That gourd was here and gone, but those Ninevites would live somewhere forever. The greatest loss in all the world is the loss of a human soul. Because there is no price tag you can put on a human soul. Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? There's no price. There's no comparison. They're, 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 we, we can't even put a price on it. We can't wrap our heads around how precious that is. We understand that that there is rejoicing in heaven when, when one soul repents and is saved, and I believe there's equal mourning and loss when one soul is doomed. Therefore, there is no expense too great. There is no sacrifice too costly that results in a human soul that has passed from death to life. It is so precious, and it is worth all of our efforts and all of our devotion. And then again, the book ends on this cliffhanger. And I, I can only imagine Jonah left it there because he then realized why God sent him to Nineveh. And he realized why God cared about these people. See, because when God looks down and sees people that hate him, he doesn't treat them as enemies. And aren't you glad for that? Because the Bible says that before you were saved, that you were the enemy of God. And that your spirit was at enmity with God. And that you were against him. But the Bible says that God commendeth his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, while we were still enemies, while we were still against God, he loved us. And he sent his son. He came down here to give his life for his enemies. You see, Jonah found delight in the potential destruction of Nineveh. But God had no such delight. God does not delight in those things. We do not serve a God who is vindictive in that sort. Ezekiel 33, 11, God said, Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? The death of an unsaved person is an unspeakable tragedy. We have to guard ourselves against a hardening of our hearts and our minds against that. We must always feel that, that burden for souls. And when we go about our day, realize that the people around us, the people that you see every day at the store, perhaps your coworkers, definitely the people in your neighborhoods, your neighbors, that without gospel intervention, they are like the people in Nineveh. They will experience God's wrath. They will live somewhere forever. And without the gospel, without Jesus Christ, they're doomed. 
they are doomed for everlasting destruction. It's good for us to ponder these things. Because the natural way, again, is to let these things slip our mind, because it's not a convenient thing to think about. But this is the way that God looks down at the world, with pity. And this is the way that I believe we ought to look at the world. And when we see people that are against God, I'm talking specifically about Muslim people, because that's what Dearborn is filled with. Dearborn is, is filled with Muslim people, but it's filled with all, all sorts of other people that are Catholic or unchurched, atheistic, agnostic type people. And they're all in the same boat. They're all the same in the eyes of God. Our mission in Dearborn is a mission of compassion. It's a mission of pity. Because our heart breaks when we see people, even though they hate us and hate God, our heart breaks because we know that they have no hope. And even though they hate us, We love them because God loves them. And we see them through God's eyes. And we start having God's priorities. And we start acting and entering into their suffering and understand, hey, God loved me when I was against him. I'm going to love this person even though they're against me and they're against God. And and the Bible says, against themselves. Or an enmity with themselves. That we can enter in and do whatever we can to prevent that destruction from coming upon them. Jonah just entered in as a a warning. That's the best we can do, is offer a warning. Not let anyone go without being warned. Pastor Nate already jumped on the Charles Spurgeon quote this morning. I don't know if we can have two Charles Spurgeon quotes in in one Sunday. Okay. Because I am also a fan. And and Charles Spurgeon had such a way of of saying things that once you go and read him, you're like, I can't say it any better than that. I'm just going to read it. And uh, he, he, this was his perspective here, and it, it has become part of my heart for Dearborn and for the whole world. Spurgeon said, If sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped about their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions. And let not one go unwarned and unprayed for. Again, we... we We are not the ones that save anybody. That is a work of God, a work of the Holy Spirit. Our role is simply to be the ones offering the warning. That's all Jonah could do. (laughs) Jonah wasn't going to destroy Nineveh or save Nineveh. All he could do is say, hey, unless you change your ways, you will be destroyed. The way that you are right now, you have no hope. Repent. 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 Change your ways. Why would you die? Live. Turn to God. And live. One of my favorite songs, it's come increasingly one of my favorite songs, is that of Rescue the Perishing. And it has the same idea in there because it says, Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin in the grave. See, when you pity someone, you understand that they are working towards their own destruction. And they're working towards their own doom. And so I'm going to inject myself and I'm going to give myself to snatch them from that. To save them from that certain fate, that certain doom. And this is the heart that we must have. Not just for the places like Dearborn and places all over the world. But for the people around us every single day. The people in this community that are against God. And this message I think is becoming increasingly relevant because so many people we would label as our enemies. The socialists. Or those that politically disagree with us, and yet we ought to have the same position of pity on them as well. Because they they don't know any better. (laughs) That's naturally their state, and it was naturally your state until God reached out in love to you. And someone shared with you the gospel. So pray for us. Pray for us as we go on this mission to warn these people of their Certain destruction. (laughs) Again, an unpopular message. (laughs) Nobody invited Jonah to come to Nineveh. Hey, Jonah, come on over and tell us more about how we're all going to die. Jonah didn't get that invitation. He went uninvited, unprompted by anyone except for God. And that is the position that I feel that we are in in Dearborn. Nobody's asking us to come, but God is calling us to go. And so we must obey. We must be faithful to 
as Jonah did, faithfully warn them of the wrath of God and the result of their sins. Pray for us as we go. Again, our timeline is we'll be moving this summer. We'll begin to work this uh, summer and fall all the way up till September to launch this church. And we are certain that there will be bumps along the way and even, uh, what I should say, some prejudice coming the other way. Again, it's not something that we're expecting them to be super excited about, New Baptist Church in town. So pray for us, that the Lord will give us boldness, and that we might, we might see a little bit what happened here in Nineveh, and some people repent, and turn to God, and be saved, and see a church established here in Dearborn, that can not just be an effective witness there in the city, but I mentioned in the video that there are 2 billion Muslims in this world, 2 billion people, that are like those Ninevites, against God, and certain to face the destruction of God. Two billion of them. That's a quarter of the earth's population. And you have missionaries come through. How many of our missionaries are going to Muslim countries? Not many. That's because they can't, for the most part. The ones I do know that have gone have been kicked out. It's very difficult people to reach and to get into. But God's brought them here. In our backyard. In an hour away from here. And given us an opportunity to reach those people and through them reach into those closed countries and reach all across the world, everywhere that they worship Allah, we can, we can reach in and we can touch those people through the people that are in Dearborn. And I know that can happen because that is what God has been doing all throughout the history of the world. And so pray for this church to be established and to be a light there, but a light for Muslim people all around the world. I'm excited to be here. Thank you so much for having us, and I, I look forward to partnering with Cornerstone and so many other churches in seeing this mission established. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you again for the privilege and opportunity to present your word. Lord, I, just, I pray that it would have a, an effect in hearts today, Lord, that you would turn our hearts towards those people who are not like us, turn our hearts towards those people who are against us and hate us and persecute us and despitefully use us. Lord, help us to love them, to pray for them, and to bring the gospel to them. Lord, I pray especially for Dearborn today. Lord, I pray that you would begin to work in hearts even now, Lord, and prepare them for the gospel message that's going to be shared. And Lord, that we would see great revivals on the level of what happened in Nineveh, Lord, there in the city of Dearborn. Lord, we know that you can do it, and we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Josh. Hey, could you guys tell he's got a love for Dearborn? Yeah. Um, I think that was very evident. What I think is so wonderful about it, though, is that this was something that was given to him by God. Here's a challenge. What about you? Are you burdened, committed to, to reaching anybody? Is there anybody that God has put on your radar? Boy, I sure hope that there is. Hey, do this. Pray for Josh and Katie. Pick up some information at their table. Make sure you stop by. Thank them for being here uh, and commit to praying for them. They also have a little um, uh, place where you can sign up for to receive their, their newsletters. and Do that as well. Keep them before you. Continue to pray for them. I know that would be much appreciated. Hey, a couple quick announcements. The first is this. This Wednesday, uh, Awana is resuming. You guys heard Pastor Sean say that earlier. Um, how many of you guys enjoy the Grand Prix? Awana Grand Prix, you guys enjoy. They've been a part of it before. All of the cars this year, I believe, are given out for free. So pick one of those up. We'd love to have you be a part of that. That'll be great. Um, and then also, uh, if you'd like to get involved in Awana in any way, uh, see myself, Miss Lucy, Pastor Sean. We'd love to get you guys plugged in uh, to something like that. And Saturday as well, we do have our preliminary uh, meeting. This coming Sunday, we have our big annual meeting. Saturday, though, at 9 a.m., we're going to have a prelim meeting. Um, if you are a member here of the church, we would love to have you join us for that. That, that is to hopefully kind of hash out all of the questions that may be had as far as looking at the budget, looking at some different uh, items for this next year. So we would invite you to join us for that this Saturday, 9 a.m., and then our annual meeting will be on Sunday. Sunday afternoon, you can plan as far as next week goes. The church will cover the cost uh, and, and the meal for you guys, and we'll be in the back uh, in the gym. Sound good? You guys enjoyed being in church today? I hope so. I always like to ask that question. I want to make sure we've all enjoyed being in church. This is no better place to be than this. And so thank you guys so much for being here. You guys are dismissed.